So welcome everyone to uh, today's Friday Fireside Chat. Uh, I am here with Leslie Crutchfield from the Georgetown Institute, which she will tell you about uh, shortly. Uh, I'm Rita McGrath, you probably knew that. A couple of housekeeping things as we get going. Um, this is going to be recorded for future replays, so don't say anything you don't want your grandmother, the New York Times, or your significant other to know about you. Um, and I don't tend to use the raise hand feature, but we do refer often to questions in the chat. And if we don't get to your question live, we will attempt to go back after the webinar and answer them uh, as we as we go forward. So uh, welcome, welcome, Leslie. Um, Leslie is someone I discovered, much to my delight, in my quest to understand a little bit about our social contract and how that is changing, how it might be better, how it might be more uh, stable. So um, Leslie is the author of this terrific book, which caused me to go hunt her down. Uh, it's called How Change Happens. And it was published in 2018. So it was actually prior to a lot of the current you know, social movements, social inflection points that we're dealing with now. And previous to that book, she published a great book on high impact nonprofits called um, Forces for Good. So I've been uh, delighted to have discovered Leslie's work and so thrilled that you could be here. And so Leslie, maybe tell us a little bit about what you do at Georgetown, um, what your institute's about and, you know, what got you to this moment. Thanks so much, Rita. It is um, such a delight to be part of this program and to get to know you and meet you. Um, I am so curious about your work and, and want to say for, for everyone seen around corners is something I'm really looking forward to delving into. Um, and, I, and I really appreciate being part of this. Uh, as you said, I'm at Georgetown University in the McDonough School of Business, and I serve as executive director of an initiative called Business for Impact. And at Business for Impact, we are all about unleashing the power of the private sector and innovation to help people and the planet thrive. We think a lot about the triple bottom line, people, planet, and prosperity. Um, and we work uh, with a range of cross-sector partners, companies, governments, nonprofits, to deliver solutions to the big complex challenges that we face um, both in this country and indeed around the world. And um, at Georgetown, I get to teach in the MBA program, our corporate social responsibility class. I also teach a course on nonprofit leadership and management. And um, outside of Georgetown, I actually do a couple courses on LinkedIn learning around nonprofit leadership and a forthcoming course, which is going to be all about business leadership and social movements coming out of our research for how change happens. Oh, that's fantastic. I, did, I didn't know you were doing all those things. So speaking of nonprofits, I just published um, a monthly ThoughtSpark uh, newsletter on, on, on strategy for nonprofits, building on some early work that was done by my colleague Ian McMillan. Um, and so for those in the not-for-profit space, what's unique about that space is that the only reason you exist is to do something where markets don't work. And so this prioritization grid really helps people hone in on where are some of the where are some of the places that it makes sense to invest our resources and where would be be more sensible either not doing it at all or partnering or otherwise cooperating to uh, to achieve. So I think you and I are very aligned in wanting wanting those spaces to get smarter and more um, effective. So let's start with um, how change happens because that's how I found you. Um, I, I basically blew through the book the first time I even picked it up. I loved it. Um, and what I thought was particularly interesting about it was the, the non-intuitive things that you found about what allows change to really take root and to take hold. And this is not obvious to, to people. And you looked at movements like the Zuccotti Park, um, we are the 1% movement. You looked at gun control, you looked at gay rights. So a lot of very interesting social movements that have either led to results their organizers wanted or not. And you found some very interesting um, things along the way. So maybe describe the thesis of the book, some of the things that you learned um, and what we could all benefit from hearing more about. Sure. Well, well let me start out by saying, Rita, that I think movements matter so much. I feel like they matter as much today, as much as they ever have, especially in this country. You know, when you think about the racial reckoning that we're in in the United States, um, the response to the COVID pandemic, the recession, um, and, and we're seeing movements rise up and different actors really playing roles in different ways than we might have seen in the last century, right? In um, 
uh, the civil rights movement, you know, throughout the 1900s, we see business really stepping up and trying to take meaningful action. Um, and this is not always just being on the opposition, right? The target of activist ire. Um, we're seeing a, a whole new engagement through social media and because of the democratizing effects of digital technologies, this power balance shift to individuals, right? Um, the, the, the relatively powerless individual now connected to millions of others creates a very powerful force um, because of digital technology. And that can be used for both uh, good purposes or maybe not so good purposes, depending on what side of an issue you, you probably are on. So in our research for how change happens at Georgetown, um, we got really curious about this question of why do some movements succeed while others don't? And we looked only at movements that have peaked in the 21st century. So they achieved a big shift, an outcome since the year 2000. And by the way, as you mentioned, the, the book manuscript was done in 2016. So we were finishing up the research right at the time of, the, of President Trump's election in 2016. So of course the Black Lives Matter current uh, uprising after George Floyd and Breonna Taylor had not happened yet. The Parkland shooting in Florida had not happened yet at the, at the time we were finishing up our research. But we really feel like the lessons mm -hmm. that emerged and the strategies that we identified in the successful movements that we did study, like gun rights, the movement for LGBT marriage equality, um, the anti-drunk driving movement um, were- Tobacco, really you mentioned tobacco. <laughs> Um, for, for really drawing out some lessons that leaders of any movement might apply as you're trying to create change. Yeah, um, and I thought, I thought that was really, really interesting to look at, you know, kind of fairly at these, for example, gun rights, you know, that that, that is a social movement. It is a, it is a, a classic sort of, here's, here's the interest that we have and how do we make that something that's part of people's hearts and minds. So in the book, you talk about specific practices, um, five, five specific things that leaders of successful movements do and leaders of unsuccessful movements don't. Um, and, uh, you know, the first one was about the grassroots and that was very much the the story I think that I took away anyway about gun rights that that you know the the, the National Rifle Administration had done a, just a masterful job of making this part of many people's identity to the point where they had this enormous grassroots sway you know of people who really strongly resonated with this particular movement's ideals and I thought that would be just really interesting maybe to to, to share some of some of that grassroots idea because you know. There's a lot of people on the on the side that would advocate for more restrictive gun legislation that kind of look at look at what's going on in, in, in shock and say, you know, with so much evidence on our side, why is it that this is not becoming more acceptable? Well, it's such a, an important point. You know, the vast if you just think about the gun issue in America today, you know, the latest Quinnipiac polls have held true for for many years that the vast majority of people in America want stricter gun laws, right? They, they want things like background checks. More than 90%, 95% of respondents to most polls, whether you're a Republican or a Democrat, whether you're a gun owner or a non-gun owner, agree. The public opinion is set in one direction, but our public policies in the United States are very different than what the majority of respondents agree to. And the reason why our public policies in this decade are not aligned with that public opinion is a result of the work of the gun rights movement. And, you know, we could talk about the, the grassroots effort. I, I want to couch this part of the conversation in this idea that, um, you know, change doesn't happen by chance, right? Change is deliberate. And when you really spend a couple of years, like I and my students and research team did looking in under the hood of these movements, you really see how deliberate it is. And let's give an example out of the gun rights movement. And just for um, listeners um, perspective, we studied movements on both sides of every issue. So we looked at the gun rights movement and we looked at the gun control movement or the gun violence prevention movement as it's currently framed. Um, 
we looked at both sides of every issue and really tried to understand why is one side getting so much traction, but the other side is either stuck or is just not able to keep up. So in the case of gun rights, there's two numbers to keep in mind, 4.5 million and 400,000. And those numbers come into view if we go back in time to the 2012 Sandy Hook Elementary School shooting massacre, not too far from, from you all right there uh, for those that are based in Columbia or in the New York vicinity. You know, on that day in Sandy Hook, 26 grammar school students and their educators were killed in a mass shooting. And at that time, the NRA, the National Rifle Association, had built up its membership to about 4.5, almost 5 million members. In 2012, the largest and most powerful gun control group at that time was Brady Campaign. It wasn't set up as a membership organization. It's a, a nonprofit based here in DC in the capital region where I'm, I'm zooming in from. And they had about 400,000 supporters. So from the 1990s until the early aughts, the gun control movement was one tenth the size of the gun rights movement if you just looked at grassroots participation. Right, And that's one of the main reasons why after Sandy Hook, even though there were pleas in Congress, there were bills that got passed and, and the people in America expressed outrage and frustration that after that, we couldn't get uh, Congress to pass something. And there's a very simple reason why. Um, while Congress people might have expressed affinity with the gun controller side of the equation, they were being held accountable by constituents back in their home districts who were members of the gun rights movement. Um, and uh, fast forward after Sandy Hook, um, things began to change on the gun control side of the equation. Uh, you had a mom in Indianapolis, Shannon Watts, a stay-at-home mom of four who was outraged uh, by the tragedy in Sandy Hook. She went online, she wanted to join the gun control movement. She even typed into her interface, probably Google, what's the MAD, the mother, Mothers Against Drunk Driving of Gun Control? And nothing came up. So she started a Facebook page. That turned into Moms Demand Action. Uh, later in 2014, Moms Demand Action and their chapters merged up with Mayor Bloomberg's Mayors Against Illegal Guns to create what we now know as Every Town for Gun Safety. But Every Town for Gun Safety has really only been around for a few years. Then in 2018 on Valentine's Day, when we had the shooting at Marjorie Douglas Stoneman High School in Parkland, Florida, you had the young people that are part of the March for Our Lives movement uh, join in with Moms Demand Action. And today in 2021, you have more than 5 million members of the gun control movement. And you start to see that the gun rights movement is starting to wane off. Um, the NRA is going through some uh, financial trouble, they're filed for bankruptcy, they're probably relocating to Texas um, uh, on last reports. For the first time in several decades, you have more grassroots energy and activism happening on the gun control side. That's one of the reasons why I think you might see, Rita, that policy pendulum start to swing back to where it was. Because if you remember, it wasn't that long ago that, long ago that we had a very strong federal gun control law. We had the Brady Bill. We had an assault weapons ban. That was passed in 1993 by that Congress. Mm. That was allowed to expire. And the one thing that can explain it more than anything else, at least from my research, is that in 1993, after that assault weapons bill passed, the NRA created a grassroots division, doubled down on building up its grassroots base, and since then has really um, excelled at that. Mm -hmm. And we'll get into some of the strategies and the tactics that they've used, but that is the key inflection point, you know, um, that I think defines um, the, the environment that we're living in today. Mm -hmm. And I think, I think that's so important because, you know, I, I live with a bunch of liberal eggheads, right? And then as you do as well, I imagine. And, you know, there's this idea that the great idea and the logic and the facts and the, you know, that is going to sway hearts and minds. And, 
And yeah, sure, that's important, but that's definitely far, far, far from the creation of results uh, on the on the ground. And and you talk about that. You know, you talk about how important it is to acknowledge and respect the the voices on both sides. And and so maybe switch to switch to gay rights because that and the story is a bit like a thriller, right? When you start with the gay rights movement, it's a shambles. <laughs> you know, it's like things are not going well. And maybe tell the story of how they pulled themselves out from that. Yeah, it's 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 interesting. And it, it really goes back to this idea that, you know, change doesn't happen by chance. And these big changes that we've experienced in our lifetime are inevitable. Right. A lot of times when you look at the LGBT marriage equality movement, pundits will say, well, it's just inevitable. You know, millennials, Gen Z, young people today are more intersectional. It's just more liberal. We're more diverse. Right. But when you think about the entrenched opposition and the vast resources of the institutions and the leaders that were opposed to LGBT marriage equality, um, it, you just can't explain this away as a mega trend, right? A result of the demographic shift. Let's go back to another point in time that I think you're referencing in the book it was the early 2000s. And um, Freedom to Marry, uh, which was kind of at the center of a coalition of many organizations fighting for LGBT marriage equality, including you know, um, ACLU, Lambda, uh, GLAAD, um, and many other organizations. Um, we're really at a crossroads. In the early 2000s, we had DOMA, right? President Clinton had signed a federal law banning different sex marriage, right? You had 13 states with ballot referendums underway trying to ban gay marriage. You had, the only place it would have been legal to wed around 2003 in the United States if you wanted to wed your same-sex partner was uh, Massachusetts, right? Um, and in uh, Massachusetts, you had Mitt Romney, who was then governor, uh, conservatives, Catholic church leaders, really vociferously trying to overturn that law. So the LGBT marriage equality movement advocates were really up against the ropes. At that moment, LGBT marriage did not look inevitable. It looked impossible. And so they had this convening over in Jersey City, New Jersey, in some conference room back when we all got together in person and were, didn't wear masks to have a meeting. And they said, what are we going to do? You know, like, and they came up with this idea of committing to what they called their 10, 10, 10, 20 equals 50 state strategy. And it's a tongue twister, but the idea is that our 50 U.S. states are not one monolithic block, but indeed very different regions and how could you tailor your activism and your advocacy to really meet the needs of where you are in the country, right? So um, if you're in New York, uh, you know, maybe go try and go for full marriage, right? Um, there's a lot of liberals and progressives in New York. Try and defend that marriage bill in Massachusetts because there's still a lot of progressives up in Massachusetts, but take 10 states and just try and get civil unions. Take 10 states and just try and get same-sex relationship recognition on the books, but take 20 states, take half the US states and don't do anything related to marriage, just try and get the discriminatory laws off the books, right? So go to Texas, get the remaining sodomy laws off the book, go to New York, try and get a full marriage bill. And what this allowed the movement to do was a couple things. One, shape itself to where those communities were at, right? And have every part, um, every state in America take one incremental step forward towards greater tolerance and equality, even if they weren't all moving at the same pace. And another thing that that 10, 10, 10, 20 equals 50 strategy allowed for in the movement, because I see in the chat, there's a question about leadership and other things that we can get to, um, is it allowed different players in the movement to act on what they thought was best. Because there was, a, in, in every movement that we studied, whether you have one fabulously or you are losing terribly, you have to deal with what we call reckoning with your adversarial allies, right? There's lots of people on your side. You all want the same thing, whether that's climate action or LGBT marriage equality or to expand your right to own and access guns, right? But there's lots of dissension 
And so in the LGBT marriage equality movement, if you really wanted to go for full marriage, you could go to New York and work on that. And if you wanted to, if you felt that marriage is not your problem, that's just a, a rich white gay guy problem on the coast, but here in the heartland, we can't get a job, we can't get an apartment, we're getting bullied, we're getting beat up, we need protections. So it allowed different members of the movement to work on what they felt was the most important thing, all moving in the same direction, um, but very, you know, think about it as the, and I think about the leaders of these movements as conductors of an orchestra, trying to get everybody in the movement to play in tune. But maybe Rita, you're playing the melody, I'm doing a harmony, we're all doing different things um, in unison. And, and that's, um, that's, that's a tricky balance. Um, and they also really focus deliberately on changing hearts and minds, which we can talk about it. Um, that might be coming in your next question. So let me, let me pause there and see if you wanna go there next. Yeah, let's do that. Because I think that's so important. And one of the things you do talk about, and I know Frank's got a question about, about leaders, um, but in the book, uh, let's see, on page 166, you've got this dichotomy between anarchy on the one hand and the the 1% protests, I guess, would be emblematic of that, right? The, the 1% Zuccotti Park kind of movement uh, versus central. You know, so you've got anarchy on the one side, centralized hierarchy in the middle, middle. And what you're really talking about is something you call leaderful behavior, which you've just alluded to, which is many different kinds of leaders doing many different things, but directionally in, in the same direction. Yes, leaderful, really, we, we pulled that from the writings of civil rights activist, Ella Baker, um, who talks about the idea as an organizer that, you know, strong people don't need strong leaders. She was very much an advocate of this idea of self-help in the black community in the civil rights movement. And by leaderful, you know, if you think about that spectrum on, on the far left, it's chaotic. You got Occupy Wall Street, 21 different demands, right? Um, and the way Occupy Wall Street was organized, no hierarchy, right? Everybody's equal, de democratic all the way through, right? And what happened is you get a lot of loud voices and that will call for the 99% into the general um, national conversation. But um, you, you didn't get a lot of policy uh, traction, right? And on the other hand, you can have these controlled top-down organizations that are typically based here in DC, you know, trying to dictate what happens. And, and the trick is to get that balance where you're leading from the grassroots up allowing that grassroots um, energy and activism, but you're coordinating at the grass tops um, in coordinated ways, right? So you're aligning around your policy actions. You are aligning around your social marketing campaigns, those campaigns to change hearts and win minds, right? Over, uh, which we'll talk about some of the strategies in a minute. Um, so you have connected grass tops leadership that are really allowing the movement to lead from the bottom up. And it, it can be chaotic and it's a it's an art as much as a science. Right, and so the, the concept of leadership, right, that, that, that Frank's been asking about, do you see a big difference in the leadership of say for-profit companies? Because I know at the business school, you're dealing with those sorts of people too, right? Um, and these movement leaders. Well, I, I think it's a great question we're actually in the midst of um, teaching an executive program at Georgetown for the National Urban League for their emerging leaders cohort uh, and, and, and that are all part of the National Urban League Civil Rights Movement Organization. Um, and yes, I think different leadership styles and approaches are required depending on where you're leading. And I think about leadership on kind of four levels, right? You could be a leader in an organization, whether you're in a nonprofit or a company, you can lead in your community. We're all members of communities, whether you're part of the Columbia community or your alumni community or a sorority and fraternity, your faith-based community, your geography. I, I live in a county in outside DC where all three of my kids are in school, so I'm part of school communities. Um, and then we're part of movements and we lead in movements and across causes, which can be national, global. And we're always leading across all of these zones, if you will, or spheres of leadership. Um, and when you're looking at movement leaders, it becomes, you know, you know, all movements are driving for systems change, 
what do we mean by systems change? You're trying to change the systems around you, right? So you're trying to change laws, policies, regulations, you know, how, how police are trained and how police treat um, people on the street is, is obviously a major focus in this moment um, of um, uh, multiple deaths of unarmed black citizens in the hands of police and injuries uh, through police brutality. Um, we, you can look at um, the norms and attitudes and what's accepted attitudes and behaviors around you. And, sh and you can change that. Um, and, um, and so, and you're, the most important thing about a movement is you're leading, but you have no direct control over those around you, right? They don't work for you. You can't hire and fire them. So you really have to lean into these powers of persuasion, of um, enabling others, as Ella Baker talked about, strong people don't need strong leaders. Um, they need to allow their leadership to um, emerge. And it, it, I think it requires most of all, um, it's a very egoless type of leadership. It can be very hard to let go of control, power, money, resources. Um, but the most effective leaders give that power away. Um, and by giving it away, gain more power and influence because they are um, tapping into the power of many, right? E pluribus unum, out of many, one. I love that. And I actually think that, you know, leading in a corporation is not all that different. Um, you know, what we've been talking about in my world anyway, is something that um, years ago was called crescent leadership or growth leadership. And so if you think about the, the idea that a leader dictates policy, tells you what to do, has the solution in mind, and then the, the rest of the organization sort of adheres. Um, and what we're seeing is a real revolution in that. And the way I would articulate it is, I think leaders today are really looking for the organization, and this is for-profit organizations, right? They're looking for the organization to present them with options, almost. It's like, let's have that human ingenuity throughout our companies, present you with these choices, present you with these alternative futures, from which then as a leader, you can orchestrate a, pro a selection process. But you know, how crazy would it be to think that one group of 10 or 15 people is actually going to architect the solutions to some of these really incredibly complex problems. I think the best they can do is architect a broad direction. You know, you set the, set the guardrails and then go to it, you know, let the people in the ingenious types within your organization experiment their way to figuring out what a great solution might be. And I think that's so much more positive and so much more similar to what you're having to do in the social sectors. You know, I agree with your insight and it probably has to do with a lot of our conceptions of leadership in the corporate world. You know, we're baked during the industrial era, yes. right? Yes. When we had, you know, scientific management and we all started getting MBAs, right? The whole management as a field of practice was born because we could control the activities of machines and mostly men at the time, um, increasingly uh, women um, uh, down to a science, right? And, and you could dictate from the top uh, rules and procedures. But now that we, at least in the United States and in the developed economies are moving into the creative um, economy, um, a different leadership approach is certainly um, warranted. And, um, and it's about unleashing innovation, right? And, um, and as you write in a lot of your uh, pieces, um, being very close to the customer, being on that edge uh, between the company and the product and the user, um, which is where you can learn um, about failures and also opportunities. Absolutely, absolutely. So let's talk a little more about this hearts and minds thing, because I think what I see certainly on, the, on, on many of the conversations I have is there's almost this attitude of, you know, if you're not with us, you're the enemy. And if you're not as pure as we are and as driven as we are, even if you're kind of directionally in the right direction, you know, we're gonna we're gonna cast you out. And your research would suggest that's not very fruitful. Yeah, that us versus them, you know, opponent um, approach is it certainly was very prevalent in the 70s um, and in other eras, and it's still there today, but it's it's much about figuring out what you're against, it's even more about what you're for and bringing people along 
to support your cause, right? So, and, and, and the thing is going back to this idea of change is deliberate. The really effective movement leaders in our research really put time and energy and resources behind trying to change hearts and minds, trying to shift public opinion, right? And using the best practices that we know in business from marketing, understanding your audience, segmenting your audience, um, meeting your audience where they're at, right? People won't care about what you have to say until they believe you care. All these you know, basic truths that we know um, in marketing, we saw being applied by the um, successful movements. And um, you know, you know, the idea behind LGBT marriage equality, just to give a sense of how this plays in, is um, you know, while they were back on the ropes, going back to that time in the early 2000s, they had DOMA, they were trying to fight these um, bans coming at the state level. And they said, well, you know, we need to understand where are people in America on our issue of LGBT marriage, right? And, and they started asking, not themselves, right? Not the, the movement, but um, people out in America, right? Mostly people who are in different sex relationships, polling. One of the questions they asked in the um, kind of 2000s was, okay, why, well, you're a straight person. Why did you get married? Answer, well, I got married because I want to um, be committed to my spouse under the eyes of God. We want to raise our children in the family. We want to be committed and, and we're in love and we're in love for life, right? And then the next question was, well, why do you think an LGBT couple wants to get married? Number one answer, honestly, in the 2000s to this general public survey, I don't know. I never thought about it. Why does a gay person want to get married? Second answer, maybe because he wants to visit his partner in the hospital uh, if he has AIDS, right? Something, something along those lines. So then the light bulb went off for the LGBT community because they're like, we want to get married because we're in love, just like different sex couples. There really isn't a difference here. And so what you started to see is a shift in their activism and in their social media and in their campaigns and their messaging became all about love, the love between committed partners, right? Um, the love of families, two women raising children, going back to that, that fight in Massachusetts where Romney and the Catholic Church, and, and I will admit I'm sitting here at Georgetown, a Jesuit institution, um, uh, fighting against that. And they said, you know, in fact, in Massachusetts, there's two religions, there's two dominant religions. They've got Catholicism in Massachusetts and they've got ice hockey, okay? <laughs> I, and I, you know, having gone to school twice up in Boston can attest to this. Um, and I'm so thankful that none of my three children have gotten into ice hockey because what, what with the ice hockey thing, what they did in Massachusetts is they happened to have some uh, two women that were raising their son who happened to be a state champion. And so they went back to this idea about love and they, and they put this family in the center of a social media campaign trying to protect this marriage law in Massachusetts. And, and you know, it was like footage of the moms getting up at five in the morning, freezing their fannies off at those 5 a.m. practices, you know, celebrating on the ice after the big win, um, showing that they're just like all the other families, right? Um, normalizing this and, and, and making it part of the mainstream rather than something very foreign or different. That was deliberate, that was strategic, right? Making love the center. And the whole idea that Evan Wolfson, the founder of Freedom to Marry and his many colleagues in the coalition would talk about is, how, you know, they, 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 they thought about America as kind of this bell curve, right? You could say there's 10% that are way in. They're, maybe they're part of the LGBT community or they're allies. And you got 10% on the opposite extreme that are the haters, maybe for ideological, faith-based, whatever reason, they're never going to support gay marriage. That leaves 80% of what they call the persuadable middle. So how do we persuade that 80% that never thought about why a gay person might want to marry to think about it and to be open to it, right? So that's who they were targeting with all their campaigns and their messages. And so then you go back to this adversarial ally fight. Well, you know, that some of the campaigns were about a straight uncle 
talking to the camera about how his son wanted to get married and the straight uncle's talking about how he came around to the idea because he was like, hey, I kind of want him to have what me and his aunt have. And, and, and so the protagonists were the straight people. Those are the people that you're trying to convince to change their minds and beliefs, right? Um, not preaching to the choir. And the other thing is they moved away from some of that more 60s, 70s activist rhetoric about fighting, you know, you discriminate against me because you won't let me wed, wed my gay partner. I have a right to this. Those rights-based discrimination um, um, frames um, are important and effective, but they can't take you all the way, right? So that goes back to your point, Rita, about getting to this positive message, focusing on love. Um, and it played a big role in changing hearts and minds. Um, by the time that Supreme Court case was heard, there's also some great examples from some of the other movements, um, tobacco control and the um, movement that really reduced smoking to its lowest rates ever is some other. And I've got some sample videos I can show if you want to talk about it. But let me pause there in case you uh, want to explore the um, LGBT love campaign. Oh, I, I love I really think that's just brilliant. So one of the things that um... I teach when I teach, uh, you know, how to, how to manage change is borrowed from Michael Beer at Harvard, and you probably know it. It's the you have to create constructive dissatisfaction, which is in the gay rights movement. I would say that's that's the fighting, that's the legal, that's the we have a right to this. But then you need this vision and the constructive dissatisfaction piece you can do with a small band of true believers. But if you really want to get to that 80% persuadable, which I think is a really great way of looking at it, you need to have a vision that's more encompassing. So if I were to take, take the women's movement as another, another example, um, you know, back in the whatever, 60s, we had these women who history has it burned their bras. That wasn't actually their intention, but they were definitely protesting about garments that were considered to be representative of women's oppression and they had this big can and it was like you know put your put your put your things that are going to be oppressed there and somebody very briefly set it alight and that put in motion this whole movement but the trope lived right these bra burning screaming horrible man hating women um and you know my next door neighbor looks at that and goes no way you know i'm not touching that with a 10-foot pole these people are awful but when betty friedan comes along and says equal pay for equal work and here we are in America. I mean, you know, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. We hold these truths to be, you know, a God-given right that we're born equal. Um, now I've got a message that connects, right? Now I've got a message that, well, yeah, I mean, that's that's a good point, right? If you're doing the same job, you should get paid the same. And so I think there's this fascinating progression that you see in some of these movements with the, the, the true believers sort of making this hard case the visionaries reaching out more broadly, and then the process folks, which is the ones I would say you've really honed in on in the book is, is, is how do we actually, you know, minute by minute, day by day, forge this thing that, that's going to change hearts and minds. It's going to really create new opportunities for something that wasn't possible before. Yeah, I think that's an, this shift from, you know, versus anti- you know, moving from the stick to the honey, you know, from the bra burning to the equal pay, equal work. It's a great example. Here's another shift in changing hearts and minds that we observed, which is moving from rational data dumps to emotional connecting with people's reptile brains, right? The, the winning movements no, understand human behavior and human emotions, right? And, and, and let, let's talk about let's talk about smoking now, right? So that issue in our lifetimes, smoking rates in, in America for cigarettes at least are down to 15% nationally for adults, under 6% for youth. Gen Z, teens and tweens could be the generation and smoking for good. I mean, when I grew up, when I was little, and I'm not 10,000 years old, right? You smoked on airplanes. You know, my mother had this whole strategy. She would sit, you know, based on what the smoking section was in the airplane. <laughs> Me too. You smoked at McDonald's. You smoked at the doctor's office. You, My college professors smoked in their offices. <laughs> <laughs> and I will admit my mom's not on the Zoom. I did it too. There's a lot of other things I regret from the 80s. Gauchos, uh, perms. There's oh dear, oh dear. <laughs> um, but, you know, so you smoke. That's changed. Smoking is not only prohibited, it's infrequent, it's unfashionable, right? It's socially unacceptable in most circles. Now I recognize, you know, go out into 
um, the heartland and to the southern states, you have a greater prevalence of smoking. You have higher prevalence in black and uh, communities of color, depending on where you are in the country. And, and those rates still need to go down. But overall, the trend you know, is massively, and it saved millions of lives and prevented tens of millions of people suffering from smoking-related diseases, right? Um, and how did they do it? Go back to this point about data. We have known since 1964, when the Surgeon General told us that smoking causes cancer, we have had the data. We have known, we have seen anti-smoking messages, right? Um, and yet our behavior didn't shift until this century, right? Why is that? Okay, um, because the, in part, the tobacco control advocates changed laws, slapped excise taxes, built up grassroots movements, built up the non-smokers rights movement. A lot of things was happening at the grassroots like we talked about before across the states. They also were really trying to win over hearts and minds, right? And this becomes important because we go back to this idea of leadership. What kind of leadership, not just styles, but skills do you need? The founding president of Campaign, campaign for Tobacco-Free Kids, the uh, central part of the coalition, um, I will say caveat emptor was, the, was founded by my uh, teammate and boss at Georgetown, Bill Novelli, who was the founder of a communications um, and PR firm, Porter Novelli. It's now part of Omnicom worldwide. Um, he led that before going on to be the CEO of AARP for many years. He's a big advocate and lobbyist, but he was the founding president of Campaign for Tobacco Free Kids with Matt Myers, who continues to be the executive director of Campaign today. Bill is an ad man, a, a, an advertising guy. He was a madman, you know, up on Madison Avenue, watch Mad Men. There's even a spot where they play Bill Novelli in it. And he understood marketing, advertising. The enemy here isn't just Philip Morris and those cigarettes. It's the iconic image of Marlboro Man, of Joe Camel, the, the, the sex appeal, the glamour, the cool factor that you're fighting. You got to fight that first. You can't just tell young people not to smoke. It's bad for them or it makes their breath bad. They don't, you know, that's not going to get to them. You need to present them with something that's as enticing or compelling to counter those very effective images. And we know from data and research, when you polled social workers in the 90s um, about uh, that were working with poor children, low income families, Joe Camel had higher name recognition in poor communities in America than Mickey Mouse. The marketing was pervasive, right? Um, so, so you have to fight fire with fire. And you saw coming out of Campaign for Tobacco Free Kids and Truth Initiative, which was this big foundation that was set up after the attorneys general sued the tobacco industry and got a big settlement in the 90s. Um, and maybe, Rita, just for fun, I could show one of the current. Yeah, that'd be great. If you can make that kind happen. Of, kind of, yeah, we'll, we'll analyze why it's been so effective at changing hearts and minds and attitudes around smoking among young people. Um, all right, I'm going to share my screen. And um, let's look at this truth initiative campaign called Catmageddon. Great. All right. So I, 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 I see you laughing. I hope that some of our guests are laughing. What, what, what do you think works about that ad? Oh, it's not preachy, right? Definitely not preachy. It's fun, right? There's the music, but mostly it's cats, stupid cat videos, stupid pet videos. I mean, you know, that's what teens, tweens, 10 year olds, 12 year olds, watch right um and um you know they got a few things right 
mm -hmm. this campaign. And by the way, even though it looks home done, this was a you know top end creative agency on Madison Avenue that did all the research and the demographic and the creative behind it. And they really got into studying what a Gen Z late stage millennials care about. They're very social justice oriented. They care about their pets. We also know what young people don't care about. They don't necessarily respond to messages about danger. What's the best way to get my now 14 year old boy to try something? Tell him it's dangerous. Absolutely. Right? But, you know, <laughs> so, so you've got to get at what do they care about? And then, and they care about their pets, right? So the punchline of this ad isn't smoking's bad for you, adolescent. Smoking's bad for the cat. So my son saw that ad. He's like, oh yeah, I would never smoke, mom. You know, it would kill the cat. It's like that ad. And so that's how I found out about the ad. We went and looked at it. It wasn't aimed at you, Leslie. It wasn't targeted for you know, <laughs> nice white ladies working in Ivy League institutions. No, <laughs> former smokers, let's say former smokers. <laughs> um, no, there's a different set for us. Um, but uh, you know, they, you know, they, uh, so we went on YouTube, looked it up. Then, of course, we had to watch ten other pet videos because you get sucked in. It's addictive in a different way. And um, I guess the other thing I got right, they got the right message they got the right messenger right it's the cats there's no mom in a wagging her finger there's no doctor in a lab coat um and nagging you right and they got the right medium right it's on youtube that's where teens and tweens consume all their media these days right it's the right message with the right messenger in the right medium and it went viral it exploded it's it's one of the contributors that's really influenced um um young people's behaviors and attitudes around smoking. Um, and if, if you're interested, um, I don't know how much time we have. There's a, another video that is, is micro-targeted to a segment of the teen and tween population, getting at this idea that there's these social disparities of health in our country, right? So you have higher smoking rates among community of color, uh, rural, um, poor white communities. So I could show an ad that gets Ooh. at these best practices that that's targeted at a um, kind of a, a very specific demographic among teens and tweens. And we can look at that as well. Yeah, let's look at that. That'd be fun. Okay, the sound's a little lower, but um, hopefully it'll work. Okay, wait, let me um, get to that. And if we can't get it to work quickly, we'll, we'll, we'll move on. Um, all right, Rita, can you, um, can you hear I can, me? I can, I can hear you and I can right, see so I'm going to start this video. It gets, it starts out a little quiet and then the sound should kick in. My brother, he's always in my stuff. I swear, the world do plays too much. And yeah. He's always watching me, but I'm always looking out for him. I'm staying fresh, like skipping out on cigarettes. Because I know if I smoke, he's more likely to smoke cigarettes too. And no matter how much he gets on my nerves, he's fam. Living tobacco free means I can influence him to come out fresh like me. For the love of family, keep it fresh. Live tobacco free. Right, so with this one, you see this, this concept of, okay, tapping into what is that young man motivation? Again, it's not about it's bad for you, but you're gonna be a rad role model for your little brother. And there's strong familial responsibility um, in his community, right? So a lot of demographic, again, psychographic research informing the message in that setting um, that's very different to target um, these urban African-American uh, community members versus maybe the cat Mageddon, which was for, you know, a different or more general audience. Right. That, that's so interesting. But you, it really is about the marketing, right? It's not about being right. So one of my colleagues, uh, Adam Galinsky, talks about a voting campaign he was involved with. And the, the original organizers were going to have this big, you know, here's all the policies and here's what you should vote for and everything. And Adam's like, that is just absolute rubbish. What you guys need to do is say, Exercise your right to vote. You have a right to, you know, to, to, you have a, a right to be powerful as a voter. And then the next page, the next third is like, 
here's the times. Pick a time that you're going to make an appointment. The next third is here is the map from wherever you are to your polling station. Here's what you have to do. So basically informing people how to take action. And I think I think a lot of movements don't ever take that step. They, they sort of talk broadly and, and they, they do a lot of talking, but they never get down to, okay, walk to the end of the block, make a right turn at 10 o'clock tomorrow morning. This is what you need to do. <laughs> you know? And I think they just leave it too general. Yes. It's, and to your point, like having a simple, strong message mm-hmm. um, and all the movements we studied, it's really connecting in an emotional way mm-hmm. with your audience. And that emotion can be humor. You can laugh at cats or you can feel empathy for your little brother. Um, with gay marriage, it was all about love, talking about we're in love, just like different sex couples. We're the same, right? Um, gun rights, if you go on N- NRA TV, you know, they used to live stream and Netflix um, carried it, but they, they don't now. Um, they, but you go on NRA TV on YouTube and it's all the messaging is very, it's patriotic, right? It's upbeat music. It's, you know, apple pie, freedom, America, owning a gun is equivalent to being American and being free, right? Um, and patriotism and, and very um, uh, resonant emotions for the target audience that they're trying to reach, right? With their messages. Um, so it's um, uh, Mothers Against Drunk Driving really centered their early campaigns. This was pre-internet. Um, their, their message was friendship. Friends don't let friends drive drunk. It wasn't, you shouldn't drive drunk. You might kill someone. You, sh- you Don't let your friend do that to him or herself, right? And, and, it, it, and so very, they didn't even come up with that. MAD did not come up with the designated driver campaign. A Canadian ad agency came up with that. But MAD was able to make it go viral. It goes back to our conversation earlier about grassroots. MAD had set up chapters in every state and had all these grassroots chapters with um, that were part that had gun crash survivors, family members who had lost loved ones to gun crashes caused by um, impaired driving, um, and um, and they had these nodes to, to 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 enact those messages. And to your point, here's a very specific action you can take. Um, you know the key campaign, the designated driver, um, and like if you look over in Europe. In, in like Belgium right now, there's a lot of beer drinking in Belgium, Bob campaign. And it's all about identifying your Bob, which is basically your designated driver. And it's cool to be the designated driver in your group. And there's a lot of social marketing being done around that. Mm-hmm. So here we are. And um, you know, we've got about, I guess, five, my goodness, five minutes left. Um, how do you accelerate movement? I mean, there's been some questions about how could you accelerate towards impact? Are there things you've learned that you think could just save a lot of would-be movement leaders time or energy, you know, that you can go straight to, here's here's the roadmap, <laughs> which I know is different for every movement. Right? I wish there was a, a single pill. <laughs> no, I know, I don't mean I'm asking for that, but just like, you know, if I wanted to, um, if I wanted to get started, right? I mean, read your book, obviously, book, um, How Change Happens. Fabulous book. I really, really like it. Um, but, but I, you know, are there some things just not even to waste your time with maybe that we could talk about? I think putting the energy and the effort into grassroots connection and authentically connecting people in the cause with each other and for the larger cause, it's, it takes time. And it needs to be done offline as well as online. It's just not enough to start the Facebook page, right? Yeah, um, and and to get the likes, you you need to um, be cultivating those relationships in the analog, i.e., real world, right? Um, and and that's what takes time and investment. And I would say, you know, from the movement perspective, if you're a donor, whether you're an individual donor a foundation, you've got a, you're a high net worth person with means it's put your money on those organizations that are doing movement building um, from the grassroots up. Um, and that's very different from, from giving or supporting to a known institution that's very trusted, you know, um, and um, and I guess I would say as I was leading these movements, it's don't underestimate how much 
energy and time and effort you're going to put into building a coalition of others and needing to be able to compromise and, and, and get to that um, win-win, right? And it's not your way or the highway in most of these things. Um, and um, in every movement, you do have your extremes. You talked about those ideological purists and they will always be on the extreme left or the extreme right. Um, but what we saw is those movement leaders that were able to get to that middle and bring lots of incremental change um, tended in the long run go farther. So one of the big debates right now, of course, is about voting rights. And, and it's interesting that both sides of that dilemma seem to have taken a few pages here and there from your book <laughs> and, and, you know, working at the local level to either promote um, voting rights as someone like Stacey Abrams very famously has sort of been associated with or to restrict voting rights as, as we're starting to see in some of the state legislatures. Um, and uh, it'll be interesting to see how that all uh, plays out. Well, Leslie Crutchfield, what an honor to have you. Um, so where do people go to learn more? Where did, what's, what's a good next step? Well, um, you could visit howchangehappens.com um, and learn more about the book. Um, Georgetown Business for Impact has more about our work and how we're um, really working with partners to apply the ideas in our book. So like right now, we're doing some really interesting research with um, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation has a new gender equality division. We're looking at how can you leverage these movement ideas to advance gender equality globally. Um, we're um, looking at, we're doing a case right now with a global brewer, AB InBev, that wants to put a billion dollars and their brand behind reducing harmful drinking, not just drinking and driving, but all forms of harmful drinking, binge drinking, youth drinking, gender-based violence that we know is associated with drinking, especially um, in places like South Africa, here in the US, um, around the world. Um, um, and looking at how can a company, I think that's this most interesting moment we're in right now where companies are being asked to under standing up, trying to take meaningful action, whether it's to fight racism, um, reduce harmful health effects of products, um, while at the same time trying to sell products and be sustainable. And I think that's like a fascinating new era that we're in. Um, you know, how can you as a company do well by doing good? Um, and, you know, and I think that's going to be what gives companies competitive advantage um, going into this next decade of the century. Well, definitely, as we think about talent, um, and I hear this from CEOs all the time, you know, they'd prefer, they'd prefer not to be dragged into sticky social issues, and yet they're younger, talented staff. I'll just broad brush that. Um, they're saying, no, you know, we want to know where you stand on things like equality and equal pay and justice and doing the right thing by the environment. We, we really do want you to take a stand on this. And so it's, it's a fascinating, if somewhat pressurized place that they find themselves in. Um, anyway, thank you. This hour has just flown. I so appreciate being part of your world. This is just great. And uh, I hope to be continued. This will be oh, Thank you so much. It's been a pleasure. Thank really, you. I really appreciate it. And thanks everyone for joining us. <laughs>